welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Now, today we're going to mess around with the light blade machine, which is basically a red sail clone, like many of you guys have got, the red and black machines. Just recently I've become a lot more aware of the other types of red and black red sail clone machines. Because since Cloudray have made this adjustable head bracket available that I designed, um, I've had quite a few queries as to whether or not this will fit onto the Red Sail clone machine. Well, this is a Red Sail clone machine, but with a bit of a difference. This is built like a tank. The biggest difference is, apart from this very stiff beam across here, the bearing assembly on here is basically a 15 millimeter bearing system. Now most of the Red Sail clone machines have got a 12 millimeter bearing system on them. And the way you can easily tell that is to just measure across the, across the rail there. So as near as damn it, that's 15 millimeters. You will measure yours and it will be about 12 millimeters. Now, the other giveaway is underneath this plate here, you'll find that there's a packing piece underneath here that packs this plate off of the bearing. Because underneath this mounting bracket here, we've got a pair of rails which sit on top of the 15 millimeter bearing block. And it's the wrong pitch holes to fit onto the 12 millimeter block, and it's the wrong width to fit onto the 12 millimeter block. So technically, this does not fit a red sail clone machine. But because this packing plate is under here, it gives us a great opportunity to provide you guys with an adapter plate, where what we can do is to make fixing holes in the adapter plate that's screwed to the bearing, and then put fixing holes in the adapter plate to take this fixing. So we can adapt from a 12 millimeter to a 15 millimeter bearing system and allow you to fit this adjustable head bracket on your machine. Now, that isn't available at the moment. I've got some drawings if you want to try and make your own adapter plate and buy this, but I'm trying to get Cloudray to make some adapter plates that will fit this. But having said that, Several other things are happening at Cloudray, which will be very interesting and maybe require your patience. Cloudray contacted me recently and asked if I saw any problem at all with them modifying this standard C-type head lens tube. This C-series lens tube is the most flexible lens holding system that I can imagine. First of all, it takes 20 millimeter diameter lenses and in the back here, you can fit a four inch lens. Down here, you could fit a two and a half inch lens. Down here, you can fit a two inch lens. You can even have a nozzle, a cutting nozzle, which takes a one and a half inch lens. In addition to that, we've got this compound lens, which will fit on there. So you can do super fine photo engraving with that lens, but that's also got a big hole in the end, which means that you can use that to engrave with a one and a half inch lens, a two inch lens, a two and a half inch, or even a four inch lens. So you've got an infinite world of lenses and nozzles that you can play with for engraving. So this is a cutting nozzle with a small hole in the end, and this is an engraving nozzle with a big hole in the end. So I've already got fitted to this machine the best possible lens tube combination that gives me every single lens that I'm likely to ever want to conquer the universe. You guys with the um, Red Sail clone machines generally have only got a very limited small lens stub that sticks out the end of a fairly short stubby head. The head is quite light but the lens tube system on it, or the lens mounting system, is very, very limited. As I said to you, this is built like a tank. I mean, this thing here probably weighs half a ton. 
I exaggerate slightly. We will actually weigh this shortly because I'm very interested as to how much the whole of this assembly weighs. Cloud Ray just recently spoke to me about modifying this C-type lens tube assembly. Why? It's already absolutely perfect. Don't change it. Well, what they wanted to do was to change it to make it a little bit cheaper. And what they've done is basically this. Yeah, no, they haven't put a silver stripe around it. What they've done, they've actually taken away the knurling and the extra diameter at the bottom here. There is no logical reason why this has got a knurled bush around here, because the lens tube works perfectly well if it's a plain diameter. It takes nothing away from the lens tube and it actually makes it more flexible in some way. And then I started thinking about it and thought, you know what? You've got everything you want there. The only thing that you really need is a mirror. We've got a mirror on here, but look, we've got half a ton of metal that holds the mirror relative to the nozzle. I've been using this machine for the last, what, three, four years? And yeah, it's, it's been good, it's been reliable, but I've always wanted to do something different about this head. This has prompted me to do just that. And here's the solution. <laughs> it's a half of nothing solution, which I'm in the process of making at the moment, and I will take you through some of the steps that I'm going through to show you exactly what we're doing. Now, the way that this works is very simple. It will bolt on here in place of all this bracketry that we've got on here at the moment. The bracket is included as part of the head. What we've got here is a little butterfly clamp, as I call it, because it looks just like a little butterfly. Okay, now that just sits on there like that. And our tube slides up in there like a V-block, and it's clamped into a V-block. Now, when you put the nozzle on the bottom, we've always got a reference there that we can set to if we need to. And that little hole is a recommendation that you don't extend your nozzle much beyond there. Because if you extend your nozzle much beyond there, it may possibly start to get wobbly. I don't think that at this projection, it will be wobbly. It'll be nice and stable. And if you take a look here, it's at least as long as the existing nozzle assembly that I've got on the C-type head at the moment. So we've got all the same adjustment that we have on the C-type head, but probably about, I don't know, maybe a tenth of the weight. This weighs, with the mirror, which I haven't shown you yet because we haven't made it yet, probably about 100 grams. And I think that this probably weighs best part of four or 500 grams. That's why when I take this off, we will weigh it. This machine currently runs at about 600 millimeters a second. I would hope that I can easily push this up to 800 millimeters a second when I've got the new head on, because this weighs half of nothing. For more than four years, I've been using these two machines without a red dot pointer. I've been using one of these machines without an autofocus. I haven't made any provision on there for fixing your red dot pointer or an autofocus system. Now I'm just pointing it out to you because this is a very selfish design. It's something that I want for my machine. If it's not suitable for your machine, well, yeah, you can admire mine and stick with your own. I'm gonna take you through the manufacturing process for this very lightweight head. It's very simple. Here it is. It's a piece of origami. Now, with this particular head, all we have to do is to tap these two holes here and here, M3. But before we do that, we have to do the folding exercise. Although I've provided a lot of stress relief just along these lines here, I don't want this face here to bend. I don't want to pull the, the, the narrow gap between the bottom of this hole and this bend line here, which is a possibility. So what I plan to do is to hold that, clamp that in a vise, so that I hold that flat, and then I'm gonna bend this. So let's take a look at my very crude manufacturing process, and I'm gonna be sending this 
to Mr Cloudray and seeing whether or not he can make this in China at a very economical price to fit with this bracket because it's part of this bracket assembly which is why I want to try and persuade him also as a total kit to provide the base plate, the adapter plate, as well as these pieces here and this. Let's start turning this into one of these. I've got to make a little mirror assembly for this unit, a very lightweight, compact mirror assembly, which is adjustable. So I haven't got any major machining facilities here for manufacturing these pieces. So I decided that I would laser cut them, this mirror, as two pieces. And you'll see what happens when I put these two pieces together. So first of all, I've got some very tough, it's called toughened acrylic adhesive, but it's capable of bonding all sorts of metals together and it's very good. So I tend not to use epoxy, but there is no reason why we couldn't stick these pieces together with epoxy resin. So we don't need much of this stuff because we're not going to put huge amounts on it. Got about five minutes before this goes off, so we've got a little bit of time, and it's very runny to start with, and then it starts to get, as you can see, it's very runny and stringy to start with, and then it will start to get a bit harder. I'm going to put a few blobs around here because I don't want it to run too far. Strings all over the place. Now I'm not worried if it goes in the holes because I'm going to drill and tap the holes. Okay, now I purposely put these here like this so that I can just drop that on top there and squeeze it. But it's going to slide around for a minute, so we'll just leave that one there while we do the next one. Okay, but now what we've got to do is make sure that we don't we keep everything nicely lined up because this stuff will continue to slide around for a little while. So if I carefully line everything up and put it back down on this piece of plastic, it shouldn't stick to it. So I'll just line all the edges up and the holes. You'll be able to see through the holes and line all the holes up. We're looking down on my vise here, and I've got a couple of um, pieces of angle on here. So now my perforations are lined up down this edge here, and I've made sure that I leave this piece just here clear. So it's got to be up high enough so that this piece here clears. Just to very gently just push this, and it'll start to bend. Now here I've got a 45 degree reference which I'm going to put up against that flat face now and as I continue to bend you'll see that I can fairly accurately de decide when I've got 45 degrees because the ruler will sit parallel with the vice jaws. Okay, so I'm pretty confident that I've... Mm, that's pretty well about 45 degrees. All right. I would be able to hand bend that, but I'm not going to because I would much prefer to do it in my fly press. And we'll roughly line this up on the center of the V. As soon as it starts to apply load, it will bend along the bend line. And as I do it, if I gently just tease it like that, it'll always bend along that line of least stress. As I start to bend this, you'll see that the tang He's going into the hole, more or less, not quite. Now it is. See, look, it's completely into the hole. I could at this stage put a weld on here, but I didn't think that was a good idea. The thickness of this material is two mil, and I've left that tongue two and a half millimeters long, so that there's approximately half a millimeter you can probably see that half a millimetre of tongue sticking out of the back here. So what I now plan to do, and we have to be very careful with this because aluminium is very soft, I'm going to have to put a drill in that hole. So I guarantee that when I start riveting this over, which I'm going to do, I'm going to push, just, just hit that with a hammer, that 
well, this will close up here. What I should do is just apply a little bit of load to it and very gently rivet it together. And there we go, it's nice and flat. You saw how quick and simple that was. For the function it's got to perform, that's perfectly okay. So just hammering that little bit there has caused some distortion here. So that's why I put the drill in that hole to stop that hole collapsing. Now I've got a special tapping head here, which I'm gonna be using. So there's two M3 tapped holes in there now, that's all we need. One of the three mirror holders has actually slipped a little bit and uh, it didn't glue completely lined up. Look, this edge here is not in line. Now just to be sure that I've got nice clean holes through there. I should just run a drill through. And there we are, mirror holders that weigh, I don't know, maybe five grams, half of nothing. Now I've made a very crude 20 millimeter diameter mirror there out of aluminium. It's not flat, but it'll probably do the job that I want while I'm waiting for a, a molybdenum mirror to come from China. Now you can see how I've fixed the mirror in very simply with just two button head screws. I'm trying to keep the weight down as much as possible that's why everything is small and compact. We've got just two springs, two adjusters on the back to give us the uh, up and down and sideways control. And we do not have a third screw because what we've got here, just at this point here, is a little screw inside which acts as a pivot. So the gap will always be roughly one and a half millimeters there and then we'll be able to move it down or up but we'll never be able to move it down more than one and a half millimetres. But we don't need to. Otherwise there's something seriously wrong with the alignment. The weight of this whole assembly is around about 100 grams. What I want to do is to show you why I've desperately been trying to get the weight of this head down. Now there's a thing in physics called Newton's second law of motion. It's a very simple formula, but I hate formula. Yeah, I can understand formula, but I would much rather picture things in graphical terms because they mean much more to me. Even if, I, even if I understand a formula, I still put a graphical image in my head. Now what we've got over here is a stepper motor. Now what we've got here is a pickup truck. And what we've got here is a Fiat 500. They don't look anything like I've just described, but if you carry that picture in your mind. Now, you have only got a certain amount of strength. Now if I remove things like the rolling resistance from the wheels and assume that the, the pickup truck has got no friction on it at all when you push it, okay? And the same with the little dinky toy car, the Fiat 500. If I was to say to you, right, we're gonna have a race now across to this side of the machine and you are going to be pushing this one, but you can't push it at more than two miles an hour, which is just a comfortable walking speed. The problem is the same rules apply to this one as well, two miles an hour. Now, I'm going to turn the machine off because this has got a lot of mass. It's very heavy. Okay, now you have only got a certain amount of strength. So you can accelerate this easily up to two miles an hour. But to get to two miles an hour, it's gonna take you maybe 10 or 15 meters of pushing. Here, we've got a very lightweight, half of nothing, weighing just a bit more than a feather. You're going to be able to get that up to two miles an hour virtually instantly. So there's gonna be no delay in getting this up to two miles an hour, and there's gonna be a long delay in getting that up to two miles an hour. You are a fixed amount of power, and you can only impart a certain amount of energy to that mass. 
And if you impart a certain amount of energy to a big mass, you will eventually get it up to the speed that you want, but it will take longer. The smaller the mass, the quicker you'll be able to get it up to speed. So here we go. We're starting from here. And what I'm trying to do, I'm now going to push the job across until look, it just touches my piece of material there. Just check. Yeah, it's just about touching. Now what that will tell me, when we look at the pattern, and we can do that now, that's the overrun time, the acceleration time. Because the acceleration time is not part of the cycle time. This is specified at 100 millimetres a second, and the machine runs it at 100 millimetres a second. Anything else beyond here is deceleration, turnaround, and acceleration time. Right, so we'll try this now at 500 millimetres a second. It's going to be a bit more difficult this time because it's going to smack. About there. So there we go, look, we've got nearly 33 millimetres of stroke there at 500 millimetres a second. But what we've got here is nearly 22 millimetres. Right, well, I've just done a few scribbles on there for you. This takes roughly 22 millimetres to slow down and stop and then turn round. But just for one stroke, let's just work for one stroke, we've got to start from nothing accelerate up to 500 millimetres a second, run for 500 millimetres a second, and then slow back down to zero. Now, the slowing down and the acceleration take roughly, well, they take exactly 22 millimetres each. Now, in terms of time, what that amounts to is we've got 33 millimetres of cutting at 500 millimetres a second, which would be roughly 0 0.07, seven hundredths of a second per scan. Now, Bearing in mind that this is not running down to zero at 500 millimetres a second. It's running down to zero, slowing down all the way. I've assumed that the time taken to slow down and accelerate on that stroke is a total of 50 millimetres, which is roughly, well, it's equivalent to roughly 0.1 of a second. So we're taking 0.1 of a second for acceleration and deceleration and 0 0.07, 7 hundredths of a second, to do the job. So we're taking about 130% longer to slow down than we are to do the job. If we can eat into this time here, we will be able to do the job faster. So here we are, this is the motor trying to push the pickup truck. On this side here, we were still trying to move the pickup truck, but we were only trying to move it up to 100 millimetres a second and not 500 millimetres a second. So we were able to accelerate the same mass up to the target speed quicker, purely because the target speed was lower. Now, I'm fairly confident that when we lower the mass of the head and change that head away from a pickup truck to a Fiat 500, we should be able to run this at 500 millimetres a second and hopefully with a bit of luck we should be down towards 10 millimetres here. A significant improvement. Now I'm going to have to stop the machine in a minute and make a change. But one of the big changes that you're going to see me have to make is this. Look where the centre of the head is now and where it will be in the future. It's going to be moved across by at least eight millimetres. Now I'm very confident there's not going to be enough adjustment on this head to move that across by eight millimetres. If that head has to go in by eight millimetres, what it does mean is that I'm probably going to have to move this mirror across by eight millimetres. Well there are two problems when you start moving this machine faster. The first thing is I want this overhang here to be as small as possible. The further it is the more whip I'm going to get on it, and as I move backwards and forwards on here at faster speeds, it's going to it's going to cause this to go into pendulum mode like this. 
OK? And that's not what I want. I want this whole assembly to be as stiff as possible. So I'm going to try and reduce this overhang as much as possible. I'm just doing a little target preparation work. And some more targets for Z setup. Turn off the machine. And let's get ripping. Now, this bit here frightens the hell out of some people. Taking the machine to pieces. I just spent ages setting the head up. Now, unfortunately, the mounting on this head is not as good as it could be because we really could do with a fixing point here, right close to where this whole thing is nice and stiff. Tucked up this corner here, there's a certain amount of flex on both here and here. So that's why this is relatively stiff and heavy, because I couldn't get behind here with a screw. The wife's watching the television at the moment, and I don't want anybody telling tales on me. Not that I'm frightened or anything, but I've borrowed her kitchen scales. 350 grams. 101 grams. OK, I was a gram out, I'm sorry. That's what we're going to replace, 350 grams. So I'm expecting to find quite a large change in the overrun length. Sadly, to put this onto this bracket, there we go, it fits on this bracket without any problem at all. But the thing is, I need a couple of extra holes in here because I haven't got the full adjustment and they're not in quite the right place. So I've made myself a drill, a drill jig here out of two millimeter perspex. A drill jig out of two millimeter perspex? You've got to be joking. Yeah, it works perfectly okay if you're just drilling one hole. It's enough to guide the drill and put my holes in the right position. So there we go. There's my holes in the... There's my drill jig with the whole new hole there and there. So I'll just screw the drill jig on to locate it. Not that these three screws, but I'll put them all in. And now we've got to take this bracket off, which basically means we've got to disassemble the whole machine again. Now, we've done this before, so it's no big deal. Remove the belt. <clears throat> I'll better take this off as well. Uh, no, we don't need to take that off. In fact, stupid, I didn't even need to take the belt off. All I've got to do is drill holes in there, drill and tap holes in there and there. Oh, while I've got it off, you see there are fixing holes in there that take this. In, in the case of the red sail, these holes are completely different. So we can put a packing plate in here with fixing holes into the bearing, and then we can drop, the, if the packing plate's the right size, we can drop that on top of the packing plate and screw through onto the packing plate. So it's a very simple modification to convert this from the 12 millimeter rail up to the 15 millimeter rail, which is what this is designed for. You may have to cut this off because your sensor may be somewhere else you'll have to find a different way for detecting your sensor. Well, if you've been timing me behind my back, that's taken about probably 15 minutes to modify the head and get this all back together again. So it's not a big job, as it's about the third time I've done it. OK, let's just tidy up and put the lens in. Now, the lens tube... It won't fit in. Yes, it will. You don't any longer have to drop the table to take the lens tube out. Now, this is not something I could have shown you before. There is a reference on here which allows you to sit it on the bottom edge there. OK, so you've got a perfect reference there if you want to keep all your lenses in exactly the same place. And I'm intending to get a set of lenses in lens tubes so that the only thing that I've got to do is to change nozzles. So the lenses will already be fixed in here and I'll probably engrave what lens I've got in on the side there. But I don't even, I can put a sticky label on there now because I haven't got to slide it into a lens tube. The sticky label can sit on the side here, out in fresh air. You saw me making some um, targets earlier on. Well, I've made a little fixture here which sits in the end of the lens tube. 
And we then put a target on there. Now, this is designed to sit flush with the bottom there. So this is where, if anything, you do need your nozzle on. There we go. And now I can use that nozzle as, a, as an end stop to set the height of my jig there. And then I put my target on these little pins. That's lined up with the centre of the mirror. That doesn't mean to say that it's going to be perfect alignment down the tube. That's just our initial rough setting, if you remember, to get it approximately in the right place on mirror three. Now, I can be absolutely sure that the burn is probably going to be out here somewhere at the moment. So we'll just put something sacrificial on there in a moment, just to see how it goes. But when I turn the machine on, I've got my machine set up so that the head always goes to the back right hand corner and it zeroes not only X and Y but also Z on this table so you'll hear it come up and it will it will shake the table as well just make sure that there we go the beam is there if I look down from above Oh, it's just about on the edge of the target, so let's give it another try. Oh, there we go. Now look, I'm about, what, two and a half, three millimetres high. So I should be able to just undo this and slide it down. Too much? Let's give it a try. No, that's about right. Just up a fraction. We don't need to be very accurate at this stage, if you remember, because this is only nominal setting onto the centre of the mirror, just so that we're roughly aligned with the centre of the mirror. Then we've got to make sure we find the sweet spot on the mirror to get right down the axis of the lens. Now, whether or not I should be able to do that with this mirror, I don't know, because as I said, this is a, let me be honest, it's a crap mirror. It's just a piece of aluminium that I polished up and it's not particularly flat. Oh yeah, okay, so we've now got to get from here across to here. And the only way we can do that is to move the beam across with the mirror number two. It looks as though mirror number two has got lots of adjustment on it. So I should be able to get at least eight millimetres that I want by pulling the mirror this way. There's no guidance or alignment on this thing at all. So I'm just going to be a little bit cunning. So there we go. There's a trick. It's a little bit bigger than I wanted. It's 9.4 as opposed to 8. Well, maybe that's going to be about right. So what I've done, I've now set a parallel gap there. And now all I've got to do is move this forward onto this end stop. And it should be basically almost the same angle that it was before. That looks pretty good. So it should basically be not perfect, but not far off. Now I've got to be a little bit careful. I might have to adjust that mirror back again because I don't want to leave myself zero gap just here between this and my clamp. So I might have to pull this forward a bit like that, give myself about two millimeter gap there. And then I might have to reset mirror number three, pull it back out a little bit to get it into the middle of here. Let's get a target burn at the other end as close to mirror two that I can. Now we'll bring it back. And this is the alignment burn. There we go. I don't think we can get much better than that at the moment. Remember, we're not worried that it's miles off centre because all we've got to do now is to grab hold of these little screws and pull it forward on the adjustment. Check. A bit more. Tighten it up and up a shade. We mustn't touch mirror two anymore because we've set that. So all we've got to do now is push that down just a shade like that. And there we go, look, we're spot on centre. Now, that may be spot on centre here, but it might not be spot on centre. This is, this is a little bit of a problem at the moment because I've got such a, I've got no idea what the quality of that beam is like. So let me just check how bad that mirror is <laughs> because I think it's pretty bad to be honest. <laughs> Look at it. It's a crescent shape. 
rubbish. Is that because it's missing the um, the mirror, or is it just distorting as it comes off the mirror? The only way that I can find that out. Right. Well, you're now looking up at the mirror underneath there, and what I'm going to do is check whether or not my beam is hitting the centre of the mirror. Pretty reasonably close to the centre of the mirror. It's certainly on the mirror, well on the mirror. So what you're seeing down here now is <laughs> a pretty serious distortion of the laser beam. That should be round. So I'm going to have to make another mirror of some sort or wait until I get the one from China. So I'll have to leave this for a little while now and um, We'll come back and carry on with the setup when I've made another mirror. Well, here we are again, another day. We've managed to convert a piece of copper bar, three millimeter copper bar, into a, a mirror. So we're now going to fit that into the head and see if we can finish what we started. So, okay, I've now got my new copper mirror in there and we'll just turn the machine on. Let's see what sort of beam we're getting down here now, shall we? Pulse. We're getting a round beam now. It's well out of line. We're going to use one of my old targets, turn it over, and we'll put it there and see where the pulse is. A little bit there. Right, so we'll put that in the middle. And there we go. So there's a target burn with the table right at the top of its stroke. We're going to drop the table by about four inches. And now we're going to see where the second burn is. Escape. Pulse. Oh, that's pretty, pretty good anyway. Uh, yeah, so we need to just bring that beam very slightly forward. So I've got to tip the mirror very slightly, which I do with an Allen key. I've got these little grub screws here. And that's all we need for adjusting because these springs here are so strong they're going to lock everything up anyway. You don't need locking screws. Quick look to see what we've done. That's not bad. We might need to go very slightly to one side. So we'll just do this one more time. Okay, and now we'll drop the table down and we'll try again. Still got to come forward just a shade. Spot on. Now what we're going to do is just drop the lens tube down just below the surface of the clamp there. Because we're now going to use the other target that I made, which is this one. I'm going to drop that in there. Just push it to the back because that represents where the beam, where the lens tube is going to sit. And we'll now check how central the beam is to that target. Fingers crossed, let's see what we get. Oh, <laughs> um, what can I say? I'm busy rocking and rolling behind the camera here. Is that luck or what? <laughs> Hang on, I'm just gonna run away and do some lottery numbers. Look at that, absolutely spot on. So we can't ask for better than that. Now, before we carry out this test, I've had a bit of a thought. We might not see any tremendous advantage initially because this is quite a powerful motor system on here, as I said, with a, um, with a servo system. Now, if you had unlimited power, to accelerate to 500 millimeters a second, we would see a different amount of offset here. But because this is not just power controlled, I go back to the vendor settings and there is a maximum speed, there is a maximum acceleration that's allowed on the machine. So I suspect that I may well have to go into the vendor settings and the user settings and adjust the speeds to suit to give me the advantage that I'm looking for. But let's give it a try anyway. Now this is 500 millimeters a second. Just drop that down onto the uh, 
There we go. Focus set. Well, that previously was 22, so we've automatically gained five millimeters over and above the previous head. But I think I can get it better than that. So I need to read my data in, and my data currently says the maximum acceleration is 10,000 millimeters a second squared. So we're gonna change that to 15,000, 15,000, 15,000, yep. And we're going to write that back to the machine. And now we're going to go to our user settings, because in the user settings, in the vendor settings, that is just a maximum limit that you cannot go beyond. And normally, you wouldn't be allowed to go into the vendor settings. The only thing that the user can do is to go into these settings. So again, we need to read what these settings are. And then we'll go down for cut parameters. Now we want sweep scan parameters. And at the moment, start speed, Y speed, acceleration, X acceleration, 8,000. So we're only using 8,000 at the moment. We'll take that up to we will take it up to 15,000 and we'll see what happens. The worst that's going to happen is the machine is going to cog. It's going to make a horrible noise as the uh, rotating field goes faster than the stepper motor can keep up with. So we'll change that to 15,000, which matches the maximum acceleration I've set. And I'm going to write that back. Okay. So there we go. So now we've reduced that to 13 millimetres. <laughs> How much faster can I push the machine? This is 20,000 millimetres per second per second acceleration. And we're now down to 10.7. I don't think we're going to get a lot more advantage. Basically 11 millimetres, let's just say. Let's not be too fussy. I mean, we've halved the amount of overrun on this machine. I'm now going to try something even more stupid because I noticed that the machine supposedly can run at 1,000 millimetres a second. So I'm going to push the cut speed, the scanning speed, up to a thousand millimetres a second. Who knows how this is going to go, but we'll give it a try. So the question is, do we gain by running faster? Because when you run faster at the moment, the overrun is so long that actually it's slower. It's, there's a compromise speed somewhere in between where the overrun and the speed balance and then when you get below that speed, you get, a, you get a net gain in cycle time. Hold on to your hats. So we might be running twice as fast, but we've pushed the um, overrun now to 31 millimetres. I think an optimum speed may well be something like about 400, where we should probably get below 10 millimetres of overrun on a 30 millimetre on a 30 millimetre program. Let's just try that. So there we are, now at 400 millimetres a second, 
we've got our 33. So the point now is, look, we've got 13 millimetres of overrun and 33 millimetres of scanning. Significant gain in cycle time. And all we've done is change the weight of the head and, OK, so we fiddled with the machine parameters a bit, but... OK, just as a final test, we'll just do my little dot test because I want to see whether I've got any wobble this way. Now you can probably just see my little dot test in there. The whole point is that those lines are absolutely straight. If the head was wobbling, if the head was not stiff enough, you would see this effect here, where the second line would start off with a bit of a wobble and the third line would start off with a wobble where it jumps from line to line and doesn't settle quick enough. We've got perfect straight lines there, so everything about this head is working exactly as I hoped it might do. Right, now we're just going to take time out for a little while because we've been up as high as a thousand millimetres a second and you've seen the machine zipping around but it didn't give us any advantage because we still had a lot of overrun. If we reduce the speed we can actually be more efficient because we get less overrun. The greater we make the acceleration the smaller the overrun time at each end of the scan and we've currently got it set at 20,000. Now it originally started off at 8,000 if you remember. We also started off with the mass of the head being 350 grams, 0.35 of a kilogram. We've now got it down to 0.1 of a kilogram, less than a third of the mass. Okay, now as I said to you early on, I'm not a lover of formula, but sometimes they point you in the right direction. Here's what Newton's second law says. We know what the acceleration was when we started off with this machine. It was 8,000. Now let's not get too worried about the units because we're not going to swap and play with the units so we can make the units whatever we want. These are just numbers. So we started off with an acceleration number of 8,000. We had a mass, acceleration times mass, of 0.35 of a kilogram, 0.35. And that effectively gave us a force from the stepper motor, or if you like, the pull on this belt, whichever way you like to look at it, of 2,800. Now again, whoops, sorry, 2,800. Now it doesn't matter what the units are, these are just numbers. I've now reduced this number here to 0.1. I haven't changed the force on the motor, I've still got 2,800 on my motor. So the question is, how high can I push the acceleration and still stay with exactly the same parameters that I started off with before we fiddled with this machine at all? Well, I don't think it takes a mathematical genius to say that 2,800, uh, if you divide that by 0 0.1, we're going to finish up with 28,000 times 0 0.1 equals 2,800. So the fact that at this moment in time, I've only got the machine to set to 20,000. I'm only two thirds of the way up the range. I should be able to drive this machine at 30,000 and it probably won't complain. <sighs> what do we think is going to happen this time? Is the machine going to complain? The laws of physics says it shouldn't. But I don't think you'll have seen this machine running anywhere near this fast before. Let's give it a go. So here we are with a direct comparison to what we just thought was fast at a thousand millimetres a second, we had a 31 millimetre overrun at each end. So out of a total cycle time, we've only got one third of it which is working. The rest of it is dead time. We forced the acceleration up. The machine is not complaining. We have reduced the overrun distance now from 31 to 23. As, as I mentioned earlier, running this machine fast is not necessarily the object of the exercise. What we're trying to do is do we get the most efficient cycle time, the shortest period to run a program. 
Now, the more time you spend cutting and moving in fresh air and not doing the job, the less efficient your program is. The whole point about reducing the mass of the head is that we're trying to get this overrun time down as short as possible so that we're spending most of our time moving the machine, doing work. Here we're going to run this test at a thousand millimeters a second. We've jacked the acceleration up to a value where it was approximately before we started. I know I've moved from 8,000 up to 30,000, but the load on the motor is exactly the same. And there we go, 14 seconds. I'm now going to drop it back to 500. took 14 seconds to run at a speed of a thousand millimeters a second. When I halve the speed to 500 millimeters a second, how long does it take? Okay, let's try 600 millimeters a second. So I'm not going to go and check everything in between, but the point I'm making clearly is that somewhere between this, which is a balance, with that, it may be 700 or 750 millimeters a second. We might even get down to 12 or even nine seconds. Okay, well, let's try 700 millimeters a second. So there we go. Now, I'm not gonna run all the way up the range and see where the crossover point is, but I think I've made the point clear that it is very important to balance the overrun with the distance that you're traveling. Okay, now what I'm just about to show you, it might sound obvious. I wonder how many of you actually do it. We're trying to get the fastest possible time we can out of a scan pattern. Let's watch this and see how it compares. We're running exactly the same parameters as we were just here. We've put less over travel into that pattern because the scan line is the thing that has the over travel on it. The less scan lines you have, the less the over travel. It's not rocket science, so whenever you set a program up, always set it up in landscape mode, even though it might be a face portrait mode. Now, I did mention that Clayborough had spoken to me about modifying this lens tube. So what they've done, they've taken the knurling off the end there and they've replaced it with a plain diameter right the way through. I'm not sure that they realize what they've done. They've just taken away some of their sails because this is a two and a half inch lens tube and it's got a deep thread in there. And it's also a four inch lens tube because you can put a four inch lens at the back there. But now, if we do that, what we have got in here is a two inch lens tube. So we've got a, a lens tube there which will take a two inch, two and a half, four inch. It will also take a one and a half inch lens and we can also put the compound lens in there as well. And because this is an engraving lens here, we can have a one and a half, two, two and a half and four inch lens for engraving, as well as a four, a two, a two and a half, or a one and a half inch for cutting. The choice is yours. So you can now do anything from brain surgery down to chopping down forests with this machine. So with that good news and the demonstration of how we've been able to turbocharge this machine, I'll say thank you very much for your time and your patience and I will catch up with you in the next session.